In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Ghost. Amen. Listen to these first words of St. Luke's Gospel, chapter 15. Now the publicans and sinners drew near unto him to hear him. The sinners drew near unto him to hear him. Today these words have come very true for all of you who have made your general confessions today. Because sinners we are. We're not born in, in uh, the, state of, the state of grace like the Virgin Mary was. But we had to be washed by Christ's blood. So we are poor sinners who drew near unto Him. You drew near, near to the Sacred Heart today to kneel down before Him to confess all the sins of your whole life or the sins since your last general confession. And you poured out to Him all your sins which He alone can forgive. And the merciful heart of Jesus did not cast you away. He did not take your life before you could come back to His Sacred Heart. But He gave you this day, this happy day, to draw very near to Him, so close to Him, that He takes you into His heart, and He washes you with His precious blood. And He calls you my daughter, my sister, and my spouse. So the sinners drew near Him to hear Him to listen to Him. And in this chapter 15 of St. Luke's Gospel, our Lord gives three simple parables. And it's all talking about the love of His Sacred Heart. The love of the Sacred Heart can't be measured because it's the love of God. Who can measure the love of God? Look out at the ocean and try to count how many drops of water are in the vast ocean that you can't even see the ends of. Count how many kernels of grain are in the the dirt or on a mountain. Count how many blades of grass are just in this field, let alone all the fields of the whole earth and all the leaves on all the trees. And if you could count all that, it would just be a speck of dust in the immeasurable love of God. And that's why St. John calls God Charity. Deus caritas est. God is love. He is justice. He he does punish sinners. But it's always motivated, motivated by love. And we can even say, you've meditated on uh, the, the pains of hell. But even the damned in hell will give glory to God because the justice will be seen. Remember, justice will be done or the heavens will fall. And man on this life can mock God and spit at Him and all our politicians and all our Hollywood and all most people of the world, the the vast majority of men can care less and continue to live mocking Him. And we were, were we not also among those sheep wandering in mortal sin, aimless, careless, negligent about our eternal soul. Listen to the first parable. What man of you has a hundred sheep, and if he shall lose one of them, does he not leave the ninety-nine in the desert and go after that which was lost until he finds it? And when he has found it, lays it upon his shoulders, rejoicing. And coming home, he calls together his friends and neighbors, saying to them, Rejoice with me, because I have, fo- I have found my sheep that was lost. I say to you that even so, there shall be joy in heaven upon one sinner 
that doth penance more than upon 99 just who need not penance. Some of the commentaries of the fathers say this, A sheep is a simple and foolish animal, which when it goes out in search of green grass, easily loses its way and wanders from the fold. And once it has gone astray, it knows not how to return to the path. So they, the sheep don't even know their way home. They get lost. And that's why they need a shepherd, and the shepherd has a, has a crook, has a hook on the crook. And the hook is to pull back the sheep, wrap them around the neck and pull them back in. So, so that there is need of a shepherd to go forth and seek the lost sheep. So we also, by reason of our sins and passions, were like wandering sheep headed for destruction and hell without a thought of God or of heaven or of the salvation of our souls. That is why Christ came down from heaven to seek us and to lead us back from the path to hell and on to the path to heaven. And St. Peter, and this is the Mass of St. Peter and Paul, the Vigil, that's why it's in uh, violet and there's no Gloria. This is the votive Mass for the great feast tomorrow, the feast of St. Peter and Paul, were, who were martyred on June 29th in, uh, on the day of their martyrdom. So St. Peter, he himself says in his first epistle, chapter 2, For you were as sheep going astray, but you are now converted to the shepherd and bishop of your souls. In Isaiah the prophet, chapter 53, All we like sheep have gone astray. Every one has turned aside into his own way. And the Lord has laid on him the iniquity of us all. Laid on him, capital H, him, our Lord, the iniquity of us all. So he's the good shepherd. And he's the one that went hunting out, hunting for your souls. He's the one that drew you to make this retreat. He's the one that gave you your baptism. He's the one that gave you your first communion. He's the one that informed you and, form, and drew your soul. And even when some were far away from our Lord, he still drew them. Because no one can come to the Father but through me, Christ said. And no one can come to me unless the Father draw him. So for any of us to even want to come back to the Sacred Heart by a good confession, to even want to save our soul, to even want to get to heaven, God must draw us with his grace. And that's his divine love. St. Gregory of Nyssa says these words when he, when he talks about the shepherd. When he found the lost sheep, he picks it up and puts it on his shoulders. And remember, sheep, they sometimes get into the wet, dewy grass. Sometimes, if you talk to people who have sheep, sometimes when they're on the shoulders, they will go to the bathroom on the shepherd and leave a mess and that's what our Lord did with us when we go to confession he took all that filth on him by the scourging at the pillar by the crowning with thorn by being humiliated and stripped naked like a like a criminal and tied up like a criminal to be whipped so violently the whole chunks of his flesh were flinging in the air and his ribs were visible. And as he was being scourged, he thought of you. And he thought of this happy day when many of you will come back, some for the first time to the Sacred Heart, and begin again a life converted to the Good Shepherd. St. Gregory of Nyssa says this, When the shepherd had found the sheep, he did not punish it, he did not drive it to the fold 
violently, but picking it up and placing it on his shoulder and carrying it gently, he reunited it with with the flock. So this is the love of the Sacred Heart. And Saint Luke continues. Then he goes on to the parable about the woman who lost the ten silver coins, the ten groats. But I'm going to jump farther ahead to his third parable. This parable is, There was a certain man who had two sons, and the younger of them said to his father, Father, give me the portion of substance that falls to me. Give me my inheritance. And he divided unto them his substance. And not many days after, the younger son, gathering all together, went abroad into a far country, and there wasted his substance, living riotously. So St. Augustine says, when, when we travel far into the cold regions of darkness, when we, when we commit sin, and when we commit mortal sin, we are so far from Christ that we already have hell in us. We already deserve the punishment of hell. The only thing that stops us from falling into hell is we're still alive in our bodies, but the souls are dead. So if we're in mortal sin, what could be more creepy, what could be more spooky than a cadaver that breathes and laughs and talks, but the soul is dead? And that's the soul in the state of mortal sin, far, far from God. And yet our Lord is so patient. And remember, there are souls in hell who never had the chance of a retreat. There are many souls who made retreats. I remember back in Richfield when Father Lafitte was preaching the retreats. He told us of a young lady who made a very good retreat. She made a good resolution not to go back living with the guy she was living with. And she, she, she did well. And when she went back, she, after, after the fervor of the retreat wore off, she started putting herself in, herself in danger and talking to the guy on the phone. And then the, the talking came to meeting and she fell back into that horrible state of sin. And the priest said, he he tried to call her, he tried to contact her, and remind her of the grace of the retreat, the reminder of the mercy of God. And the next news he got from about her was she was killed, both of them, in a sudden car crash. It does happen a lot. So don't throw away this grace. That goes for all of us, all of us, myself first. We must not throw away this grace of God's mercy. And this is what the young man does. He goes far away from Christ, wanders into a far country, and there wasted his substance, threw away all his graces, living riotously, that is, carelessly and in partying and all kinds of vice. And after he had spent everything, there came a mighty famine in that country where he began to be in want. And the the famine, what can fill our soul in this earth? You can have all the money, you can have all the cars, all the homes, all the clothing, all the fancy jewelry and cosmetics. The soul's empty. Nothing can fill our soul on this earth. So we're in the famine country. And St. Jeremiah, the old prophet, said, the, when God allows the loss of the faith, the earth becomes like a desert. And when he takes away good shepherds, that's one of his greatest punishments on the Israelites, was when they lost the prophets, to yell at them and kick them in the rear and remind them they got to convert and turn back to God and save their soul and escape the fires of hell. So we are in famine when we are away from God because the, 
Our heart is hungry for God. Our heart is made for the supreme happiness of the vision of the Blessed Trinity. And our Lord is here. He's right here with us. The Sacred Heart is right here. And He's failed. He likes to play hide and seek because He wants us to seek after Him. And on the day of our death, hopefully, and certainly when we, by God's mercy, enter heaven, then you will see the smile of God. Then you will see the joy of the Blessed Trinity. And that's what we're made for. But on this earth, it's famine. So what happens? And he went and cleaved to one of the citizens of that country. And he sent him into his farm to, to feed swine. One of the fathers of the church says he sought one of the citizens of that country. He, he found false friends, party friends, worldly friends. And women can find these very easy. Call the cell phone and you, uh, you, you speak to the worldly friends. Oh, my husband is this and my husband is that and he's a jerk and he's a... And how many women have been, have been encouraged to divorce, encouraged to an unhappy marriage, because they're told by their worldly friends, oh, another child? What about you? What about your career? What about your personal fulfillment? And they get filled with the spirit of the world and they abandon the path of heaven. And they throw on the blue jeans and get a career and abandon their husband and even abandon their children, some of them. So the citizens of that country, he attached himself to false friends who lead them to hell. And St. John Bosco saw many boys in hell because of bad friends. And now the bad friends can be easily accessible. They're not, they don't even have to be living people now. You got on internet all sorts of bad friends that'll take you to hell. Talk shows and bad websites and these will all take you to hell if we indulge in them. And he sent him into his farm to feed what? <coughs> to feed a bunch of pigs. To feed pigs. And he would fain have filled his belly with the husks and the swine that the swine did eat, and no man gave unto him. So there he was left, hungry, eating the husks, eating what doesn't even nourish his soul. And that's the emptiness of this world. And how many people have joined this Protestant church, and that Mormon church, and that congregation, and this congregation, and even the Navas Ordo, and their souls are empty. Empty. And even many have gone to St. Peter's Society, and it's the, it's the right Mass, but it's something absolutely wrong with it. And it's the lack of the faith, the lack of the real, full Catholic faith. So he's starving, this guy. And returning to himself, he said, How many hired servants are in my father's house? And they abound with bread, and I here perish with hunger. So he's thinking of the good old days at, at home. He's a little homesick. How many of you have been away from home? Even now you're away from home. Maybe you're not homesick because you get a little break from your husbands <laughs> and the house chores. But if this lasted a month, it'd be, maybe you would be homesick. I've been in many uh, boys' schools, many schools, and uh, the boys all get, many of them get homesick, some to tears, the younger ones. And uh, it happens. But homesickness is good for us. Because St. Augustine says that pain of homesickness should, how, should be how we feel and how we think of our heavenly fatherland, of our real home in heaven. We should be homesick for heaven, says St. Augustine. We should long for our heavenly home, desire with all our heart to see the face of God, to see the joy of God. And He can't wait for us to get to heaven. He's already here. He already anticipates this joy. 
And that anticipation is already in your soul because he's present in your soul by saying divine grace. We'll continue. I will arise, said this younger son. He's homesick. He's thinking about all the good times at home. And he says, I will arise and I will go to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. I am not worthy to be called thy son. Make me as one of thy hired servants. And rising up, he came to his father. And when he was yet a great way off, (coughs) his father saw him and was moved with compassion. And running to him, fell upon his neck and kissed him. So remember who's telling this parable. It's it's our divine Lord himself. It's his sacred heart that's speaking through all this. And the father sees his son from afar off. That means the desire of our Lord for any sinner who's far from him by mortal sin, separated from the life of grace. Our Lord looks and desires with all his heart that he comes back to him. And he, he, he goes out in the morning to look on the dirt roads and on the pastures and even in the woods for his son. If he'll come back, longing for that day that he would come back. And that happy day comes. So you see the tenderness and the longing of our Lord. And how he said, with desire I desired to eat this Pasch with you. I have a baptism wherewith I am to be baptized. The baptism of his blood on, in the Passion on the cross. That's the baptism he's talking about. And how I am in anguish until it be accomplished. So our Lord makes known to us how much we really hurt Him, offend Him, when we commit mortal sin. We, we, the, the, the damage we do is to ourselves, firstly, but, and it, 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 but it offends God. But it also hurts our Lord very much. So we see the love of His Father, that is the love of the Blessed Trinity, the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost. And he was moved with compassion. Our Lord was moved with compassion to come become flesh for us. And running to him, he ran to us in the way of the cross. Our Lord ran to us tripping and falling, carrying the cross, carrying what, what we did to him, knocking him down by our sins, tripping him by our sins mocking him by our sins. And on the way of the cross, the Jews forced his path to go through Jerusalem much longer than the shortcut to the, to the gate of the western side and then up to Golgotha. The Jews blocked the shortcut so that he would have to go the longer route through the city. And going through the city, they chucked at him cabbages, tomatoes, eggs, rocks, spit, and kicking him like an animal, kicking him so hard that the shroud shows that his kidneys gave out, they stopped working. And all that urea acid came out through his pores in the sweat. So our Lord, he ran to us. He ran after us on the way of the cross. And St. McTeeld, she's the Benedictine nun who was a twin sister to St. Gertrude the Great. Our Lord appeared to both of them. And he appeared once to St. McTeeld. And she asked him, Lord, why did you fall so often on the way of the cross? And he said to her, my sister and my spouse, because I wanted like David danced before the ark, I danced for you. That was my dance for you all in blood and when I fell I got back up just for you thinking of your soul and don't this is not just sentimental talk this is not just poetry you some of you are grandmothers 
and you know the favorite color of your grandkids, you know their birthdays, you know their favorite ice cream. And if you grandmothers know so well the details of your own handful of grandchildren, how much more does the infinite wisdom of God know all his, cre- all his children from the time of Adam and Eve all the way down to the end of the world? He knows all of us. So when he was carrying the cross and so thirsty <coughs> and dripping so much blood, and when you drip a lot of blood, <coughs> you become very thirsty. And our Lord thirsted for your soul. He thirsted for your conversion. He thirsts for your participation in His divine life here on earth by sanctifying grace and in heaven by vision. So He ran the way. As the psalm says, Psalm 18, Christ was the giant that ran the way. He's the giant that ran the, 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 like an athlete running the rigors of his sprints. He ran the way of the passion to save those of goodwill. And running to him, he fell upon his neck and kissed him. St. Bernard, if if St. Bernard was here, he would go on another hour just on this verse. (laughs) Because this is one of his favorite verses. The kiss. The kiss refers to the Canticles, chapter 1, verse 1. Let him kiss me with the kiss of his mouth. And this kiss requires two lips, the upper lip and the lower lip. The upper lip is the divine nature, the lower lip is the the human nature, and Christ kisses your soul by taking on our human nature, and he gives you the kiss of forgiveness and the kiss of the divine grace in your soul. That's what happens when we go to confession. Christ washes us with your tear, with his tears, with his divine sweat and especially his precious blood. That's what washes us in confession. When the priest gives absolution, no matter how many and no, and no matter how great the sins that might exceed the number of the the sands on the seashore, when he, when the absolution takes place, Christ's blood washes the soul. The, the chains on the soul are dissolved and broken. And he, and the, he pours into the soul the sanctifying grace, which is the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost dwelling in the soul. So the sacred kiss that he speaks of is the kiss of the spouse. And this is the the divine love for each soul. So what happens? And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and before thee. I am not worthy to be called thy son. So you see, this is this son is he really realizes the horror of sin. Horror offends heaven. Horror is an insult to God. Sin is an insult to God. Sin is what we are when we commit sin, a black ant on a black rock uh, in a black night, raising its fist against God and spitting at Him as if God is threatened by that. But when we offend Him, us little black ants on a black rock in a black night, which is what we do when we commit sin, this penitent soul realizes he's offended God And this is true contrition. True contrition is to know I have offended God. And that's why in confession the priest will sometimes have to ask the penitent, especially children who can go by routine, why are you sorry for your sins? Well, because I might go to hell. Well, that's not the best reason. What's the real reason we got to be sorry for our sins? Well, because I don't want to be bad. Well, that's not a good reason either. What's the real reason we got to be sorry for our sins? Because I've offended God. That's why. So this penitent comes back. I am not worthy to be called thy son. And the father said to his servants, Bring forth quickly the first robe, 
and put it on him and put a ring on his hand and shoes on his feet. Okay, let's hear what St. Anthony of Padua has to say. He has something interesting about this. St. Anthony of Padua. Christ says to the soul, What will you have for a pledge? A pledge is something given as a guarantee. The soul, so as to be sure of the promise, asks for a pledge in the form of a ring, a bracelet, and a staff. The ring denotes formed faith. So the ring, according to St. Anthony of Padua here, Christ puts on you the ring, that is, the faith, to know the faith, to know the catechism. And we are, do you know that we are all obliged by the first commandment to study our catechism, to study the faith? We are all obliged to do this. And yet many Catholics will go months and years and years without ever picking up the catechism or reading any spiritual book or anything to, to nourish their soul. They'll fill their gas tanks with, with gas. They'll fill their stomachs with food three times a day. They'll water their plants. They'll feed their dogs. But they'll never feed their soul. So they wither away and starve and die. So the ring is to receive the formed faith, that is, the, the, the understanding, even in the smallest way, of the faith. So Luke, St. Luke says, put a ring on his hand. St. Anthony says that the ring is the seal of the faith, by which the promises are signed upon the hearts to the faithful. To put the ring on the hand is to put it into operation, put it in action so that the faith may shine out in works and by faith works may be strengthened the bracelet on the arm going around the arm is the works of charity which extend the arms to help and support the shoulders to bear the burden of a brother's need the staff with which to defend oneself against dogs and support oneself from falling is the discipline of penance by this the soul defends herself against the devil or carnal passions and supports herself against falling into mortal sin, says St. Anthony. In these three we understand the whole of justice which is to render unto each what is his own, namely the ring of faith to God, to believe all that God taught, the bracelet of charity towards our neighbor, and the staff of the discipline of penance, to oneself so the father gets all this for his son the state of grace and, and then he gives him the best gift and bring here the fatted calf and kill it and let us eat and make merry the fatted calf what's that the fathers of the church say <clears throat> especially St. Augustine Christ is the calf fatted because he was fattened that is loaded down with opprobrium humiliation whips and spit and scorn and blasphemies so Christ is that fatted calf who was sacrificed on the cross and that sacrifice today is made present in a few moments on the altar. The very same sacrifice of Calvary. And He pours out to you in Holy Communion. He gives you His divine heart itself. It's not a representation as the Protestants taught. It's not a symbol as the Navasoto teaches. It is the real, true, living body, blood, soul, and divinity of Christ sacrificed for you to feed you with His own heart, His own divine fire, His own sweet wine this is the tremendous love of God nobody could ever dream of this that God would love us this much nobody could dream that but it's, it's a fact because this my son was dead and has come to life again 
was lost and is found. And they began to be merry. And that is all the angels rejoicing over one repentant sinner. So today many angels were rejoicing. It seems a small thing, doesn't it? Go to confession and come out. But St. Augustine says, how many go to confession, go into the confessional and kneel down. They go like Lazarus into the tomb, dead. They're dead. And if they, if they died at the moment, they'd be forever burning in hell. But when they go to confession, the miracle of absolution takes place. And the blood of Christ absolves and washes them cleaner than, than, than wider than snow and brighter than the sun by sanctifying grace. So that when a, when a soul leaves the confessional, he comes out like Lazarus, risen from the dead, with a new life, that is the new life of grace in the soul. And this can happen hundreds and thousands of times even. Because Christ Himself said, forgive without number. And He does in confession. But we can never and must never abuse His divine mercy. So see the compassion and the love of the Sacred Heart in pouring out to us these great gifts which the world doesn't know. I have hidden these things from the wise and the prudent of this world. But for the little ones, they see these treasures. The wise and prudent can care less about the Holy Eucharist. They can care less about going to Mass. They can care less about going to confession. They're like, uh, they're like insects crawling on the ground looking for the, the newest piece of dirt to eat. The newest enjoyment, the newest pleasure, the newest vanity. And that's how most people live. And they don't like the light. Because the light reminds them of, because our conscience and our soul is made for God, the light reminds them of that. So when the light shines on them, and the grace of God tries to touch them, they turn away. They don't want to hear about God. They don't want to hear about prayer. They don't want anything to do with Him. And these poor souls are like, lift, when you lift a rock and you see the insects just scatter. And they dive into their little holes because they can't stand the light. And these are the children of the darkness. And we also were once children of the darkness. Born in darkness by sin. When we commit mortal sin, or any sin, even venial sin, we love, we, true, we show our pref preference for the darkness. But now you are washed in, in His precious blood, and you walk in the light, says St. Paul. So walk now in the light while you have the light, lest the darkness overtake you. And the darkness, that is the Prince of Darkness, is always trying to set traps for us, to make us trip and fall. And, I'll, and we can go on forever, but let me just make one warning. And that is, one of the biggest tactics of the devil is gradualism. Little by little. To fall little by little. To become negligent about venial sins. And then that soon leads to venial sins. But the devil doesn't want to stop there. He wants souls to get into the habits of mortal sin. So that they're so entrenched in mortal sin that they feel trapped and can't get out. And then the devil's final attack is despair and discouragement. That I'm too bad for God's mercy and I, I, I'm too bad, He can't forgive me, I've done too much. And the devil locks them. And this is what St. Thomas Aquinas says, is the sin of blasphemy against the Holy Ghost that cannot be forgiven. What is it? It's called despair. Because the soul says to God, I'm too great a sinner for your mercy. Our Lord throws the, the life saver buoy, He throws it out to the drowning soul, and it's right there. Judas had it right there. All he had to do was grab it. And he said, no, I'm too bad. I, 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 that's, I'm, I'm too bad to grab onto this. I'm, I'm, true, I'm, I'm not worth saving. 
And yet our Lord does everything to save us. Because every soul is worth saving. Because you've been all bought by Christ's precious blood. An infinite price. <coughs> so beware of that devil of gradualism. Of slowly compromising. Of slowly going back to the worldly ways. Back to the uh, occasions of sin. To the wrong people. The wrong places. The wrong websites. The wrong things that lead to sin. And separation from God. And this is why the scripture says we got to take the axe to the root. Use violence to cut those occasions of sin. And this is what our Lord means when He says, better that you pluck out one of your eyes, if your eye leads you into sin, pluck it out. Meaning, pluck out the occasion of sin. Cut the occasions of sin. Do it now while we have time. So that you can save your whole body and soul. And that's what our Lord means. Better to cut off your hand than to enter heaven uh, or go be thrown into hell with your body and soul, the whole body and soul. Cut off the occasions of sin. So gradualism and the, the slow eroding the devil works on all of us. He tries to erode us. And that's why we need often, every day, go back to the pray for that grace. Keep the rosary. Stay close to the Virgin Mary. She's the mother of mercy and tenderness. And she's the mother who is strong. And she crushes the devil. So let us go now to the Sacred Heart. And to the sacrifice of the Mass. The fatted calf is killed. The fatted calf is Christ. And He will... He will reenact that sacrifice soon and feed you with His divine love and fire. So make this communion, all of us, make this communion today like it was your very first communion. Like a child. Because your soul has become like a child again. To God who gives joy to my youth. A soul, a body may be 90 years old, but if the soul is in the state of grace, it's like a young child. And I've seen that in, in many old people who live holy lives. They might be old in their body, but their hearts are young. And old monks too, whose hearts are young and are easy to laugh. In the monastery, Father John of the Cross, he told me, he remembers when he was a young monk in France, one of the things the monks have to do is if they break a dish or break a tile or break a tool, they have to kneel at the doorway of the church and all the monks walk by and they have to hold their broken peace. So it's kind of for humility. <coughs> and he remembers one old monk who had a whole stack of plates set in the table and he slipped and he fell and broke every single one of them. So the next day that, that old monk, he was old and he could have taught all those younger monks a big lesson and he did, in fact. He was at the doorway kneeling, holding his two, two broken pieces of plate as all the monks walked in. And his soul was like a child. He wasn't proud, oh, I, this is too low for me. He was easy to be humble. So this is what the joy of the Holy Ghost brings a youthfulness to the soul. So be young of heart and uh, come to the Sacred Heart Come to me, ye little ones, and I will refresh you. So let's ask the Virgin Mary to help us make this communion, kneeling with her, that we be inflamed with the love of God and always fight to get to heaven. O Mary, conceived without sin. O Mary, conceived without sin. O Mary, conceived without sin. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen.